full cup and uh, um, I am in beautiful Del Mar, California. Um, thanks for attending uh, today. We're going to do managing your internal investigation uh, program. This is a little bit different uh, in that it's not going to be a sort of a focus on how you do an investigation. There'll be a, a little bit of that, uh, but it's going to be a different focus on how you structure a program, how you keep an internal investigation program operating, and some basic requirements uh, for that within uh, a compliance organization, within an organization. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you have trouble hearing me, please let me know. Uh, you can use questions or uh, the questions uh, panel. Obviously, if you have questions as we're going along, please feel free to write those. If I don't get to those as we're going along, I'll uh, write you afterwards. Uh, again, the most, uh, the most asked question is, can I get a copy of these slides? And just as always, um, please make sure, just uh, shoot me an email right after at uh, mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com, and I'll send you the slides uh, in terms, uh, and I'll get them out. Usually, I try to get them out the same day as the, uh, as the uh, uh, webinar. Anyway, this is um, a really, uh, I mean, I, this is an important webinar in the topic to cover. Um, and the reason that it's important is that there's much more focus on internal investigations, obviously, as the government relies upon people to do internal investigations. Um, you know, it, when you may have an issue with the government, they're outsourcing it to other people. But that's one issue. Uh, that's one issue, but what I'm talking about is a more defined issue, which is within your company, within your organization, how do you run an internal investigation program as part of an effective uh, compliance program, ethics and compliance program. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, there are a lot of sort of nuances to this. There's a lot of uh, material to cover in this, and I apologize if I do rush a little bit, but there is a lot actually. Uh, I started to think that maybe I should have cut this into two, but let's go through it and uh, and, it, and and see how far we get. But I think we'll get through most of it. But there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of information to cover. So let's start first on an internal investigation program has to be part of every compliance program. Uh, going back to the anti-corruption uh, guidance that we got from DOJ and the SEC, which is good not only for that area for anti-corruption, but it also has very helpful, uh, you know, insights uh, into other areas as well. So let's start first. Uh, um, the, what's interesting is that in the guidance they talk about a company having an efficient, reliable, and properly funded process for investigating allegations. And we're not just talking about legal violations, we're talking about code of conduct violations. Obviously, code of conduct has to be part of your mix here in terms of internal investigations because you have to enforce your code of conduct in that sense. Uh, the importance uh, is clear. This is the standard that you're ju judged by. So the properly funded process is important language that they put in there for a reason because they've seen processes that are not properly funded. They've seen companies that don't pay enough attention to their internal investigations unit. And for that reason, you've got to be uh, mindful in terms of this, of making sure that you have adequate resources and adequate um, you know, personnel to make sure you can get this job done. You document the company's response, obviously, for discipline purposes and remediation. And the third sort of uh, leg of this is you have to take the lessons learned and update your compliance program. There has to be a loop back from your internal investigations process and um, uh, a loop back to fixing your internal controls, enhancing your compliance program, and in my view, it should go also back to your training program and how you're going to train people and what issues are you going to emphasize. So here are the basic three goals of an internal investigation program. One is you want to obtain information that senior management needs to identify potential problems, code or legal violations, where they get quickly, as quickly as possible, 
uh, enough of the facts that they can make a good legal and factual judgment as to what to do. Um, and that is an absolute critical part of this because obviously if your company gets hit with something that's big, you want to make sure that you have a process in place that you can identify quickly and move and put senior management in a position to make important decisions. You also, now let's go to another function. The other function is that there's a mechanism by which people can raise and speak up in a speak up culture, raise the issues, and you have a reliable system that you can point to and say, we investigate potential problems, we find them out, we do it aggressively and we do it quickly and we get a response. So if you raise an issue, we're going to investigate it. So you've got to have that connection between speaking up and acting on it. Third is you want to keep data and information that's needed to inform the board of directors, senior management, and every, everybody who's involved in the internal control process so that you can uh, design, modify, whatever you have to do to update your compliance program. So this is your goal, these are your goals of your program. The expectations that people have, you have to be aware of. The expectations are that the board and senior management expect your program to be able to independently investigate something and report it and do it quickly and effectively. Uh, managers and employees, they want Everything, and this is very important, is that they want it to be done consistently. Uh, investigations have to be consistent, transparent, to a certain extent, without obviously violating people's privacy rights. And complainants want confidentiality, they want protection from retaliation, and they want a quick resolution of whatever issue they get that they raise. Uh, they, and managers and employees also expect confidentiality as well. Subject is, subjects of investigation expect confidentiality and fairness. If they can get a fair shake on an investigation, that's what they want to see. And obviously, if the federal or state government is involved, the prosecutors involved, people are looking over it, you're going to have more expectations in terms of how this process is going to work. So let's look at step by step. You, you map out your internal investigation process. And an allegation is raised, and there are many, many sources for that, and we'll talk about that. There has to be an intake or classification screening process. Just like any entity that has investigative resources, going back to my days at the U.S. Attorney's Office, there was an intake part. You take in complaints, you take in allegations, you take in whatever, and you classify them. You figure out how to handle them. This will get handled with this process. This will get handled with this process. Here's who's going to be responsible for it. That's your assignment. You assign it to HR. You assign it to whoever is going to do it, depending upon how your unit is uh, designed. Is it a standalone unit? Is it uh, integrated into other functions? We will get into that in a little bit. Then there's the investigation itself. There's the monitoring of your investigations to make sure they're proceeding along. Uh, properly, that they're going to be done within a certain time frame, and then there's your resolution and your remediation and your discipline or whatever result is going to come uh, of this. Uh, somebody asked a question about what brands of case management software. Uh, there are several out there, um, uh, and I, 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 I don't want to get people in trouble in terms of that. Uh, Navex Global, who uh, you know, I do a lot of work with. They have very good case management software. The network has it as well. Uh, iSight is a third one, and I don't, I'm not as happy with iSight in comparison to the other two. Okay, so your, your structure of your program, you're going to have to have a supervisory committee. This committee is going to be responsible for staying on top, reviewing and monitoring internal investigations. Okay, you're going to, it's going to be the resolution that it's going to resolve your investigation, close, open, uh, propose a discipline, or even actually give out the discipline, uh, depending on your stakeholders. You're going to have on it, you're going to have your chief compliance officer, your general counsel, you have representatives from finance, you're going to have security on it, and you're going to have uh, internal auditors, etc. Okay, internal audit on it. 
uh, you're going to have a committee. This is a senior committee that watches over the internal investigation process. Then you're going to have your operational unit. Now, is depending on the size of the, 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 the your company, you're going to have either local investigation units in regions or countries, or you could have it centralized. You're also going to need to have a hotline investigation management service as well. A lot of the hotline services, if you use Navix or whatever, they have case managers who can work on it, or you may have case managers who uh, man the hotline in that sense. But uh, this is these are in the big companies. In a smaller company, you may just have one or two people doing this, reporting to a group of people. Um, it depends on how you're going to do that. The third is you've got to have collectors or receptors. By that, and I put in here ombuds people. Uh, GE, for example, has a very interesting uh, system. They have uh, scattered throughout the company ombuds people, they're called. And all they literally do is take in information and pass it along. They don't resolve it. They don't do anything with it. They're basically there to collect it and escalate it up the ladder. The hardest thing that bigger companies have, and many companies have, is how to escalate issues, how to get people to bring the issue to them, and that's and then how to escalate the issue. That's a totally different uh, topic, but I'm just saying you have to have some people who are trained and know how to do the collecting uh, in, in, in terms of what's important and then passing it on. Okay? So how do you set up an internal investigation function? Okay, in larger companies, we've talked, uh, we've talked about uh, the idea of uh, uh, the idea of a, a separate unit that uh, is just by itself for the larger companies. I've seen this now, where they are large units that basically are um, uh, within the company, and they're just investigators who investigate and write up investigations and then pass them on. You can have them as part of the uh, compliance or the legal or the audit function. Uh, it doesn't matter sort of where they are uh, and where you put them into that. Uh, the investigative function has to interact. They have to have support function. For example, IT is critical, security is critical. And you may need human resources personnel as well uh, and procurement people just to understand. Uh, a lot of times they can help you uh, in terms of understanding that. Dependent people um, are the board, your audit committee, your senior management, uh, you know, any other stakeholder uh, would be good as well. Now, there has to be first where you are setting up your program, you have to have a standalone written policy. Why? This is going to be a promo piece. It's going to be, here's how, these are the standards by which we're going to conduct internal investigations. We're telling you up front to everybody, this is the way we do it. And it's internally disseminated to everyone to encourage a culture of speaking up, meaning you want people to trust the system. The way you trust the system is you promote the system and tell them the standards that you have. You may have a promo piece that is, you know, five pages long and then more specific procedures once we get to the, uh, to the, to the sort of nuts and bolts of it. That's fine. You can do it that way. But you want to make sure that you have this um, process described and laying out the standards by which you're going to operate. That's very, very important. The process for your initial assessment and your investigation of issues, you want to define your types of, types of internal investigations. Most importantly, and we're going to talk about the nuanced issue of privilege versus non-privilege. Most of your investigations, and we all know this, are going to be HR investigations. That's a very specialized type of investigation. Those uh, tend to be handled with HR people, but nonetheless, you have to make sure you lay out the process of how you're going to do that. The same uh, goes with regard to your serious or non-serious types of investigations, but that's the way I sort of uh, break them down, and I have a chart for you on how you do that. Uh, you're, you're going to define the assignment process. Who's responsible for that? 
there will be a timely investigation requirement. Uh, I do believe that almost all investigations, most, the bulk of these are going to be done within 60 to 90 days, and you should hold yourself to that standard. Uh, there should be a standard procedure, uh, standard operating procedures for documenting so that you keep a record of what you do, how you did it, why you did it, and ultimately we want to keep a record of your decision making and resolution process, which will be by the supervisory committee. Okay, so your standard operating procedures, okay, for, depend upon the different types of internal investigations that we're talking about. You, almost in every investigation, there's certain basics you're going to have. You're going to have an investigative plan, okay? You're going to have a worksheet. You're going to have uh, witness, uh, you know, interview scripts, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. Witness interview reports. You want to have a standard form. Uh, and try to make it as standard as you can uh, with regard to that. Scripts, you're going to have a script. Please use a script. There are too many times I see people going out and saying different things. But upjohn warnings, which are critical, uh, when you want to preserve a privileged uh, investigation, you're going to have to have standard upjohn warnings, and you're going to have to have a documentation procedure for that. There are various ways you can go on that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You want to have procedures. Who's going to contact witnesses? Who's going to arrange it? Who's responsible for doing that? You have to have a reporting form. Let's say you have a reporting form on the status of an investigation every 30 days. Have something like that. The other issue that people are not spending enough time on in their internal investigation process is to constantly, constantly emphasize that you have a non-retaliation policy and you document it. Give them a statement of that. Give a complainant that. Have them sign it that they received it. Keep a record of that. You want to use consistency in formatting, consistency in forms and documents and reports because it's good to do that way because then you can maintain a consistent quality. When you let people operate on their own more, you get into more problems. Um, and then you want to have a defined procedure for resolution, meaning these are the papers, these are the reports, okay, here's the internal investigation report with all the papers, the file that goes to the supervisory committee. You have a, for one person who's, let's say, responsible for reviewing it and prepares some type of summary or something like that. Or, and then you have a doc, you document how the committee resolved it, what they did with it, and what was their resolution for how to handle it. Okay, that's your standard operating procedures. The board has to monitor your internal investigation program through the audit committee, usually. Uh, unless you have a compliance committee at the board level. The board is going to monitor the program. The board every quarter should get a report that says, here are all the investigations we have. Here are the numbers. Here are the significant ones. Uh, let me give you an update on the three most significant ones. The board should know and never get blindsided by an internal investigation. But you want to monitor your program as an important part of your compliance program, not just your legal risks, not just your code of conduct violations. You want to have the board looking at it, just like senior management. Same with senior management. You have quarterly reports to the board, the audit committee. I want to see as many codes created to define the types of internal investigations. I don't want to see just four categories. I want to see like 30. I want to see 35. It's easy to do when you start thinking about it. Supervisory committee obviously is going to monitor investigations for resolution. You're going to collect and manage the data, and you're going to slice and dice it. Here's an example. You have 10 HR complaints out of 1,000 that came in in one year, but 10 came from one particular unit in South America, in Brazil, okay, and 10 related to one supervisor. You want to know that. You want to know, you want to use your data, slice and dice it, to look at it from different ways so that you can inform your compliance program. 
you've got a problem supervisor, this is going to be the way it's going to expose it. That is going to make you a better company. It's going to make you better because you're going to address the problem and you're going to go for, you know, go forward with that information. So that's why the data and the analysis is important to you. It's a great way to think about and a great way to work uh, in understanding what's going on in your company. It's a great resource for that purpose. Okay. So your intake sources, we've talked about how important intake is, uh, are going to be obviously any way that you can get a complaint or a concern. A lot of them come through human resources. Direct managers. 60% of employees want to tell their immediate supervisor what's going on, a problem. They want to tell it right to them. Studies show 60%. Okay, the problem is that almost 90 to 100 percent of all those direct managers in surveys will tell you they don't know how to handle the issue when it comes in. They don't know how to respond to it. So your direct managers have got to be trained and sensitized to handling complaints. Okay, you have the employees want to tell them. The managers are are telling. Every study, every survey that's done, I don't know what to do with it when I get it. Well, that is the crux of a problem, okay? That's how you define a problem, and that means the compliance program has got to respond to that and train those people how to handle concerns. Okay, other, ish, other ways. Obviously, hotlines. Internal audit usually finds things. Uh, they can become an intake source. Third parties. Who knows, you have a supplier who tells you some problem with an employee or something. You have, obviously, government intervention. Uh, we have whistleblowers who are all out there, and we have board directives. Sometimes the board wants to know more about an issue, and they'll tell you, or a, a unit, and they'll tell you to investigate something. Occasionally happens, not that often. Most of your complaints come through the hotline and human resources. People, when they feel they have a problem, usually will walk into human resources and, and, and tell them. You know, they may go to their direct manager first. Direct manager can't handle it. Then they go to HR. Do you need to conduct an internal investigation? Okay. What are your, how are you going to define the parameters of your program? Somebody raises a concern, comes in to you. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be investigated. Sometimes they're raising a concern they don't understand how a policy operates. They ask a question that doesn't mandate an internal investigation. You're keeping track of your internal, uh, you know, speak up, complaints and questions and things like that. But you have an advisory role too. So you're going to determine the nature and scope of any problem. Uh, if it's something that can be handled outside the context of an internal investigation program, then obviously you're going to do it, handle it that way. Where you do need to investigate is where there's a question as to what occurred. What was the conduct? I went to the, uh, to the, um, to the vending machine and a person looked at me the wrong way and I could have heard him mutter some epithets, you know, towards me. Okay. Well, that's a fact. You've got to investigate. How are you going to investigate that? When you need to investigate any type of conduct or any type of uh, situation where you have a factual discrepancy or a serious matter, we'll talk about that, or there is a risk of litigation. But almost there's so much litigation nowadays that uh, there are going to be many, many incidents where this uh, arises, and obviously potential criminal liability is going to be something as well. What type of internal investigation are you going to start with? Well, this is a critical issue and it can change. The most important issue is whether or not to conduct a privileged or non-privileged investigation and whether or not you uh, should protect the privilege or not. Not all investigations need to be privileged. Remember that. Not all investigations need to be privileged. There are code of conduct violations. There are uh, some even legal violations where you don't necessarily need the privilege. 
the most important part of the privilege is used in serious investigations. And for obvious reasons, where there are situations where there are serious ramifications to the company, reputational or legal, you want to conduct those in a uh, privileged way. And you want to make sure you do it right, because we're going to talk about the Barco case and what it means and all of that. Okay? Every investigation, however, to preserve your ability should be authorized by the head of legal affairs. I don't care who, if compliance says we need to investigate this, that's fine, but I want an authorization letter memo at a standard form used that comes from the head of legal affairs. Whether or not it's going to be privileged or not, I still want that, okay, in every case, because I want it authorized by legal uh, because I want to have some legal officer who always authorizes and initiates the internal investigation that needs to be done. It can be part of a program to say these types of complaints will be done this way if you want. You don't have to do it in every case. In other words, getting a letter, you can have it for certain classes of it, certain types of investigations as well. The big ones, the serious ones, have to be done uh, with an authorization letter. Now, then who should conduct it? You can have lawyers who do it. You can have auditors do it. You can have compliance people do it. It does not have to be lawyers. Okay. Uh, when you do have a privileged investigation, it is good to have lawyers involved in the interviewing process. There's no doubt about that. Okay. But I will talk about that in a minute when we're going to talk about a privileged versus non-privileged investigation. You have to make a determination as to the seriousness of what you're looking at up front. And sometimes that's hard. I've seen investigations that started on a conflict of interest issue and then turned into a humongous issue. Um, there's something about conflict of interest, but whatever. So it started as a code of conduct violation, and then it turned into a major legal problem. So you want to be careful how you do this uh, in, in keeping your options open with regard to privileged or not privileged. Last, remember the mantra. Everything that you're doing, if you want to keep it privileged, you're going to have to use magic language for purposes of analyzing issues and providing legal advice to the client company. That is why we do things if we're in the privileged con uh, context, okay? So let's look first at serious versus non-serious types of investigations. Let's think about them. Obviously, an FCPA investigation, a False Claims Act fraud, and I'm talking about these are not just, this is a company sort of wide activity, and I trust cartel behavior violations of export controls, sanctions. Um, if your board or senior management is involved, and even if it's just one senior manager at the C-suite level, then you're going to, it's going to be serious by definition. Any type of major data breach, we've seen those these days have been become that way. Obviously, any safety issue, major safety, any safety issue of any serious consequence, not slip and falls or this is a wet floor or whatever. I'm talking about safety in the production of whatever your your product is, it could be it, you know, getting oil, be it whatever it is. Major accounting fraud, obviously. When I use the word major, what I'm really trying to distinguish between is a one-off, a one person doing something, uh, you know, or two people stealing money from a company. The non-serious, like I talked about, there are a lot of employee theft or embezzlement cases. One, you know, employee misconduct, it's an HR issue. Uh, HR claims of harassment. A minor accounting fraud, when I, what I'm looking at in those things is when people are doctoring the books to cover up their theft or embezzlement or to steal money. Uh, code violations often are non-serious. Conflict of interest may start non-serious. Uh, professional fraud, 
lying in a, you know, let's say a resume or something, and uh, isolated privacy disclosure. I mean, people, we run into private, privacy accidental disclosures all the time, not like a data breach like a target or like a major retailer data breach type thing. That's a serious thing. So you have serious versus non-serious. In almost every serious case that's up there, those are going to be privileged. You protect the company from disclosure because you want the ability in a serious investigation, you want it privileged because you want to protect the company. When there's a company interest of reputational harm, a major criminal investigation, or the government could get involved in this, then you want to protect the privilege because it gives you the ability to identify a problem, resolve the problem, and maybe even remediate the problem without going to the government. But it's got to be privileged. You've got to protect your ability to do those things underneath the cloak of privilege. In the non-serious cases, there are examples. So there are some of these non-serious cases I would do in a non-privileged way. Unless I'm anticipating major litigation with an employee, okay, uh, if it's, you know, you're thinking it could become part of a class action, you're thinking it could become a big uh, HR case of some sort, um, then you've got to be careful and you may want to do it under privilege. But isolated incidents of employee misconduct, there's no reason to put that in privilege, under privilege. Here's the reason why you don't want to use privilege in these cases. You want to use this information to, in, you want to use the transparency of it, the resolution of it, as a way to inform and enhance your compliance program. There is naturally a, ten, a tension between the needs for information and compliance to use this as a way to encourage more speaking up, to inform a program, to tell people why you're doing something in a particular way and why, why the system is working internally. And you want to be able to do that. You want, there is a value to people knowing that, for example, somebody stole and they were fired. We're not going to say who it was. We're not going to violate the law and privacy thing with that. But we are going to encourage um, a speak-up culture through transparency and through recording. Um, one of the ways the Department of Justice and the SEC want to see incentives, but they also want to see disincentives for people to uh, engage in code violations and unethical behavior and illegal behavior. So you want, this is where you get into the tension of privilege versus non-privilege. We do not want the lawyers doing all the non-serious investigations under a cloak of privilege. We just don't want that. And people have got to stop being obsessed with the privilege issue in cases where they don't need the privilege in cases where you don't need it to protect the company and you don't need it to prevent um, you, to prevent any harm to the company, uh, and you do need it to send a message to other employees that the system works, that people who violate the code will be disciplined, those types of things, okay? Obviously, uh, if we get into issues of whoever conducts your internal investigation internally has got to do this with, um, there has to be sort of an independent function. In other words, when you have a unit, let's, that's the ideal, you're a big company and you have this unit of investigators and people who, that's their job, is to investigate this. You want to sell them as independent and objective. Their job is to find the facts, the dragnet rule, the Jack Webb rule. You want them to find the facts. Um, you can have in-house counsel uh, and compliance officers involved in this, and I think it's good, but you want to preserve that independence, okay? And you want to use that, um, you want to promote that independence and objective function, okay? That's why when we get down to it, the people who do the investigation are not going to be people who decide on what, how to resolve the investigation, whether it should be closed, disciplined, and what type of discipline. Their job is literally to find the facts. 
and we want them as really good, well-trained, factual searchers and people who know how to get the facts passed, analyze facts, and then just pass those facts on like a machine to the next level for dealing with it. Outside counsel, by the way, will always, when you bring them in, and usually it's a serious matter, and by definition, they will protect the privilege, and they will hopefully, you're looking, and we, we talked about this issue before, you're looking for independence and objectivity, and there's always the tension of whether or not you should use an outside counsel who already does a lot of other work for the company. Uh, and you get into that issue of whether or not that person, that firm, can be independent and objective. Be careful with that. We already saw what happened in uh, New Jersey with the investigation uh, conducted by an outside counsel where one of the partners was a friend of the governor, Christie, and it basically, that you might as well have taken that whole investigation and thrown it in the trash because it wasn't independent and objective. Like a best friend was involved in it. You can't do it that way. Um, so you want to be careful with that on who should conduct your internal investigation. Your team, your internal investigators, okay? I can, and I do a lot of this, and I'm not trying to promote the service that I provide, but train them, train them, train them, and train them. Train over and over and over again. Obviously, the best way of learning of how to do in, uh, independent and internal investigations is to do them. That's absolutely the best training you can get. But you want to train and train and train and train. The more training, the better. Please do it. Have a whole session like uh, you know one I do on witness interviews, how to approach difficult witnesses. Uh, up John, have a whole training session on up John and all the things that you're going to incur uh, that are going to happen with regard to up John. Okay, the other way that you bring standardization in the process of an internal investigation team is to use templates and forms. The investigation plan, witness interviews, up John warnings need to be written out. I know. People think that they're so smart they can just tell it to somebody. Not true. Read, have a document prepared, and let me tell you something else. My recommendation is you get the witness to sign it and give them a copy of what the warnings are. Don't try and trick anybody on the margins here. Don't try and be cute. Don't try and be anything. Do it by the book. Do it right, and, and you will avoid a hell of a lot of problems. Investigation reports, have a form for that. Make sure that certain topics are covered with regard to your investigation reports. One of my most important pet peeves and most important things to do, how do you keep your investigators from going off on ridiculous tangents? I've seen it all too many times. A, a investigation starts, it gets slowed down because they're off in some, uh, you know, uh, in some or uh, in some type of um, just waste of time, the way you do that and you make it part of your templates and available resources is you define the elements of the offense, okay? I can't tell you how important this is. If you say in order to establish a violation, a sexual harassment violation, here's what got, has to be proven. These are the issues. One, two, three, four. That's it. That's your focus. That gives them focus by definition. Your training is going to be key to these templates. And that's the most important thing you can do to prevent people from wasting time on tangents. They usually start to hear stuff from witnesses and go off on a tangent. Stop the tangent searches. This is how you keep your system within 60 days of resolving these types of things. So it's focus your investigators on the elements of the offense, and that's what you got to stay, uh, stay involved in. Okay, now your initial statement to the witness, 
like I said, upjohn warnings, by the way, can be given by a non-attorney. We are not that special as attorneys, okay? Um, and we are not that special. What is going on now is uh, there's a lot of litigation that's going on where people are trying to get documents related to internal investigations. For whatever reason, companies are uh, fighting it, claiming privilege over documents that are just not privileged, okay? Uh, I read a case where it was involving the notes that people took at a hot, you know, taking hotline calls when they wrote down the types of uh, complaints that were coming in and wrote down information or typed it into something. Uh, the lawyers wanted to see all those logs. And the company sat there and said these are privileged. Well, that's BS. It's not privileged. Turn it over, okay? Turn it over. So that's what, uh, what I'm saying. So you want to have that to make sure that your upjohn warnings are used for your privilege. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, with regard to the process uh, and how you do this, you have to obviously tell people the nature and purpose of the interview while you're talking to them, that they're required to cooperate. You can tell them that because that's a condition of them being an employee. Um, you have to tell them that you represent the company. You do not represent uh, them. You don't have to say it like that, but you say, I represent the company. I'm here in my capacity as an investigator for the company. If the employee asks if he or she needs a lawyer or will they lose their job, uh, you say, look, that as the investigator, you are there just to get the facts. That's not my job is what you say, basically. That I cannot advise you on. I don't have any, uh, you know, my role is simply to investigate this and determine and get the facts. The company, you have to tell them, holds and decides on the waiver or assertion of attorney-client privilege. The information, they also control the confidentiality of the information. And the company, not the employee, the company will disclose the information as it deems it necessary. That's that's basically what you have to cover in your upjohn warnings, but I'm going to write them out in advance. I'm going to write them out in advance. I'm going to have a form, and I'm going to have them signed. Okay, I know this sounds uh, like I'm being uh, overly burdensome with this, but I'm tired of litigation over this issue. I want to take that away and just have a record of it as opposed to testimony. The Barco case, and I wrote about this on my blog, which people are talking about, uh, there's this sort of uh, hysteria going on that somehow internal investigations um, will never be privileged again if the Barco case is upheld. That's not true. Uh, when you look at the facts of the case, uh, KBR conducted an internal investigation of fraud uh, I don't know why they did it in the way they did. It was not. It was a. It was basically mishandled by whoever handled it. It was horribly handled. Uh, it was authorized by the general counsel, but they didn't give it any upjohn warning. No witness was told anything about the interview, and all they did were, was get non-disclosure agreements. People were being in, uh, interviewed without being told what was going on. So what really is going on here is the district court judge looked at the documents and said, oh, my God, this was a massive fraud conducted by KBR, and they, deter and they found and the internal investigation showed it. Um, the fact that it was pursuant to the FAR regulations and a mandatory disclosure requirement, uh, the, the, that did not waive the privilege uh, because in the FAR regulations for mandatory disclosures, there's um, – a provision which protects the privilege anyways. Um, what's going to happen in this case is not the nightmare scenario, but we're going to go back to basics and the trial judge is going to be told, apply the standard of whether or not this is a privileged document and go through it document by document. The judge just brushed, broad brushed it and said everything is not privileged. And that was lazy. Uh, and the judge is going to have to go back and do the work just like every judge does in terms of determining whether or not something is uh, privileged or not. So I'm not worried about the Barco case. I'm not worried that the nightmare is going to happen. You still can preserve your privilege. You just have to do it carefully. That's all. 
Okay, so like I said, we're going to work to make sure if we're going to have a privileged investigation, we're going to have, for example, the chief legal officer authorizes it. We mark all of our communications and documents with the attorney client work product privilege. We use emails. We use that magic language that I had before for purposes of providing advice uh, in, uh, uh, to the company um, on legal issues. We always give up John warnings. We use attorneys uh, more in a privileged case. Um, outside consultants need to be retained through counsel. Uh, that's the way you, you have their outside work going through the privilege. Um, and like I said, we have this tension between ethics and compliance and the need for transparency, and we have the legal need for privilege. Uh, and in serious cases, the privilege is going to win, win out, and rightfully so. Uh, in non-serious cases, I'm much more leaning towards non-privileged cases, non-privileged investigations. But you have to make this determination on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay? It really, uh, you get good at it after a while. I, if I see a case, I can tell you whether or not it needs to be privileged. I don't have a, it's not that hard uh, to do so. When you're designing an investigation plan, we want to require an investigation plan in every internal investigation. We want to know what the timing looks like, the documents that are going to be needed, the interviews of whom, obviously, your complainants uh, and people who are subjects of the investigation, uh, and the offenses that are under investigation and the elements of that. We always, always wall off subjects of investigation. Okay, if my conduct is under investigation and I'm an attorney, I am not going to be involved uh, in any aspect of that investigation. That's the surest way to make sure that things are screwed up. Okay, so you wall off your subjects of your investigation. Routine investigations, like I said, should be done in 60 to 90 days, 120 at the worst, but I don't want to see that. 60 to 90 days is plenty of time in most of these cases. 80% of everything that comes in is going to be HR related. Okay. So you have IT people, security of investigation. What I mean by that in your security of investigation is that your documents, your work is protected, confidentiality is protected. You want to make sure that your, the steps that your investigators take are secure that they're not disclosed, okay? You want to need to know basis is, is the rule here. Nobody knows unless they need to know. Um, you always have to look for in-house experts and coordinating with your financial and IT people. Uh, and sometimes you go to outside counsel. Um, but you have to modify. You have to have the ability. Investigations start one way and end up another. That can happen. Uh, but you have to have a process by which that is uh, that occurs. You always, always need a vision, okay? And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, psychedelic vision here or a drunken vision. I'm talking about visualizing what the case looks like when you put your investigation plan together. This is a hard thing. It, you either got it or you don't. You have the ability to do this or you don't. It's hard to teach it. But what are the legal elements? Where? Who was involved? Who, I want to have a vision of where I'm going and what the end result is going to look like. It will help me to define my universe of documents and who I want to talk to uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the investigation itself. Okay? In your written report and your conclusions, and I'm, I feel very strongly of this, the investigator reports the facts makes credibility determinations, which is absolutely critical. The way you protect your investigation is you want to make sure there's credibility determinations made in the report because why? They can never be second guessed. It means that they can never, you can't revert, you can't say that an investigation was improper because somebody made the wrong credibility determination. The value of having a person speak to another person is the ability of that investigator to make a credibility determination, and the facts will stick. The facts will stick. Obviously, if it's, 
you know, ridiculous, it's not going to stick. But for the most part, if it's a he said, she said, back and forth, and they make a credibility determination, that's going to stick. You're going to be able to defend it up the line in court, wherever it ends up being used. You can defend that judgment. You can defend it because it was made on a credibility determination. In my view, investigators should never recommend resolutions. Okay, they should never say here's what the discipline should be. The more, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Discipline has got to be given out evenly by a neutral body. And what I've seen too much of is people get screwed up and companies get screwed up because uneven discipline. Senior manager commits the same offense as a lower level manager. Senior manager gets off later. That's an absolute way to ruin your compliance program. I want the committee, whatever supervisory committee structure is set up, to resolve the cases, review the facts, and recommend or impose the discipline, depending upon how you want to have it done. You can have all the discipline. They can make a recommendation to HR and then let HR impose it, have the meeting with the person and impose the discipline. There should be, obviously, procedures for meeting and dealing with the complainant. And the supervisory committee is responsible for taking lessons learned and moving those through the compliance program. Okay, and obviously, the lessons learned have to be reflected, again, in the compliance program, in the compliance program. So the importance of what I just said of consistent discipline. If your internal justice system is not consistent, you will lose. Your people will stop reporting. People will start you stop using the system. There will be frustration. Management has to communicate and own the discipline. I like when management says, hey, this quarter we discovered this many of these violations and there was discipline imposed against four people for this. I'm not telling you who they are, what they were, but there was discipline imposed. That is the best message to get out. If you do something wrong, the system works. If you do something right, the system works, but you're not getting punished for something. Obviously, you want to have a system that works. And so management has to be very sensitive, and that committee has to be very sensitive to how it handles out discipline, how it handles it, how it meets it out, because we want to make sure that they've got a good message to tell. How There are many ways to handle the, the actual giving of discipline, but the standard and the resolution should not be done by the investigator, but is done by a supervisory committee, or uh, in conjunction with HR in some way, okay? Somebody asked me uh, if I do feel the, that investigators should not, uh, you know, be making uh, decisions on that, and that is exactly my point. Investigators should literally be fact producers. That's what they do, and they don't do anything else uh, in terms of that, okay? Now, um, another question that was asked was, what's my position on having a specialized team of investigators versus a partnership model where trained multidisciplinary members are assigned to investigate, but their core role is not to investigate? Um, I, I don't, either one of those models works depending on, uh, you know, the needs of your organization. I like having a specialized team of investigators. Uh, the partnership model, uh, depending upon how big it is, it can work, but I want them all trained and using the same forms, same templates, same procedures, same reporting requirements. Uh, you know, sometimes you just have to get, resource and get and resources and get bodies uh, where you can, and other times you can, uh, you know, uh, create your own unit. It's even better to have in my view, your own unit with just factual investigators, and that's their job. Um, it, it is a much better way, uh, I, I think, to go. Okay, the keys to success. Uh, the keys to success in every program, 
okay? And and these are basic. Is you have to supervise, you have to have very good supervision of your internal investigation process. However, it's working. From the board on down, folks, this is a board matter. It's a senior management matter. It's not just compliance. It's not just legal. It's not just audit. It's everybody working together. Uh, you have to have communications among all the interdependent functions that we've talked about here, and there are a lot. It has to work. The more you define here, the more that, and I hate to say it, you're obsessive compulsive about mapping out your program, writing it up, defining it, and training on it, the better it will be. Um, you have to have a very good supervisory team, people who are really going to put the time in and going to do their job, stay on top of these investigations. They get reports from the investigators, either a presentation to them about an investigation, or they review the reports and follow up. You've got to have a very active supervisory committee. Uh, and you want a lot of training of your investigators. This is where they screw up. They do stupid things if, if they're not trained. Okay? You've got to impress upon them the importance of staying down the middle, doing it right, not cutting corners, and not trying to trick people. That's not what you're trying to do here. We're not like trying to trick people into confessions. We have a job to do, and this is the job we're going to do. Uh, you want your support functions, obviously, to be um, responsive. You want them to be willing to help. You want them to go the extra way uh, for, to help out your process. Uh, the triaging is in the, assess the internal, in the intake assessment of a case is really hard, but you get a good feel for it. If you limit it to people, a few people, then they learn, then they see. Okay, here's the intake process. There's, here's where it's going to get assigned. This is this type of case. It's going to be an HR case. Okay, here's how we're going to do it. Have these people do it. That's the accurate triaging is really important. And do not forget your upjohn warnings. Okay, you've got to adhere to this. There's too much litigation over whether or not this person was given upjohn warnings. And it comes down to, okay, they memorialized it in a memo. I'm past that now. I'm past that now. Let's get a document, let's get it signed, and let's go from there. That's the best way that I think uh, you can do this, okay? And it's just, you want it, you don't want to, uh, uh, you don't want to me mess with that, okay? All right. Um, before we go uh, finish up, there were a couple more questions that came in. One was, uh, uh, what is the, the U.S. attorney-client privilege standards, uh, in other words, attorney-client privilege here, doesn't apply abroad the same way as in the U.S.? Would you recommend following the U.S. standards despite uh, uh, that they're higher than those in Latin America? Uh, I would always use the higher standard, um, you know, uh, in terms of privilege. Uh, just do it out of an abundance of caution. Uh, you know, it's easier to get it in uh, the UK. There's different uh, privilege standards there. But I, I'm going to be pretty vigilant on the privilege issue and do as much as I can to meet every uh, standard. Uh, one other question, what is the best way to communicate to the rest of the organization employees the deterrence effect without jeopardizing confidentiality? Never use the names of people and never use um, information that may be singular in nature. When I say singular, meaning that everybody knows there was only one investigation on this issue. It was Joe Blow who was the employee. And even though you don't use Joe Blow's name, everybody knows who it was. you got to be careful with that. Uh, if it's a singular information, meaning it will identify somebody by the nature of the information itself without the identity being disclosed, you can't use it. Uh, you don't know don't want to engage in a privacy violation. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we just made it on time. Um, uh, again, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, please uh, send me an email. I'll send them uh, right out to you. Uh, follow me on the blog, uh, Corruption, Crime, and Compliance. 
Uh, we have our law firm website. Uh, we do do a lot of internal investigations. We do internal investigation training. Um, if you need any help in coming up with your program and how to write it up, happy to help with that as well. Um, so uh, we're not too expensive, we're small, and we, we're pretty nimble. Um, and also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the webinars. Um, and here's the link for that. And I'm going to post this uh, uh, on the uh, on YouTube soon, uh, the same uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thanks again for attending. And I'm sorry we ran over a little bit, but I appreciate it. Thanks again.